Keith Holford, born in 1935, spent much of his spare time researching the history of Bokesworth and had amassed a considerable archive of material. When he died in 2020, his archive was handed over by his family to the parish council. Furness Vale History Society was given access to this material and it has been scanned and digitised with a view to eventually making it available through a public website. Today I'm taking a random dip into the archive and I'll be presenting a selection of photographs and stories from Boxworth's history. I'll use both versions of the village name because some items refer to the time before the 1930 name change. First, I'll start with one of my favourite pictures from the 1920s. The cyclist is passing the houses known as Rosie Bank on his way into Boxworth from the Chinley direction. Here's the Reverend J.R. Towers, vicar of St. James's Church, and one of the leading advocates of the change of the village's name from Bugsworth to Boxworth. In the centre is the row of houses known as Lower Christ, facing the Peak Forest Tramway. To the left are houses facing the spoil tips of Christ Quarry. These were demolished to make way for the bypass. And beyond, we can see the houses on Western Lane. The next picture shows the quarries from a different angle. This community, part of Bugsworth, was called Baron Clough, but is now better known as Western Lane. And there's yet another view looking along Western Lane. And yes, you can see two cows standing in the road. Reverend Towers was not alone in promoting the name change. He was strongly supported by Mr Prescott, headmaster of the village school. This photograph shows Mr and Mrs Prescott outside their home in Briley Green. Not everyone was in favour of the change of name. A poem even appeared in Punch magazine. A thousand years in Bugsworth had Parsons called the bands and yokels born in Bugsworth put beer into their cans. The Bugsworth village blacksmith, beneath his chestnut tree, has always stated, Bugsworth is good enough for me. And shall they change the title that stood the test of years? Rise up and fight for Bugsworth, ye gentlemen and peers. But change it did, and the station was photographed as soon as it received its new name board. Keith recorded a story of Bugsworth Station. This story was related to me by Mr Leo White. Mr White's father was the station master at Bugsworth between 1921 and 1931. He took over from Mr O, who moved to Gargrave in North Yorkshire. Mr White was the last station master at Bugsworth because after he finished, it came under the care of the Chinley station master. In the middle 1920s, a commercial traveller called at the station, tapped on the ticket window seeking information about trains to Manchester. The next train was not due for about half an hour, and it being something of a cold winter's morning, after dealing with the inquiry, my father invited the gentleman into the office. There was always a warm and cosy fire going at this particular time of year. Prior to leaving, this gentleman handed my father his business card. His name was George Haywood. About a fortnight later, this man was arrested in connection with the murder of the landlady of the Lamb Inn on the Hayfield Road. Eventually, George Haywood was tried for his crime, found guilty, and a few weeks later hanged at Nottingham Jail. Some considerable time later, my father was visiting a variety show at the seaside. I think it was Blackpool. One of the acts consisted of a blindfolded gentleman on the stage who performed together with an assistant who went through the aisles of the auditorium, asking various people for items out of their pockets, purse, handbags, wallets, etc. 
Whatever was produced from the audience, the assistant would hold up in the air. And it was for the blindfolded gentleman the assistant had in his hand. My father was sitting on an end aisle seat and in the centre aisle, and he was asked to produce something from his person for the gentleman to determine. He handed the assistant George Hayward's business card, which was still in his wallet. When asked what was being held aloft, the blindfolded man replied, I do not like speaking about the dead. This sketch comes, I think, from a Burnage High School brochure, printed after they took over the station house as an outdoor activities centre. Because of the increase in rail traffic, it was decided to demolish Pugsworth Tunnel and add two further sets of tracks. The tunnel was finally, de finally demolished in August 1920, and by January, the four tracks were in full operation. Alf Goddard, who latterly lived at Rosie Bank, gave this account to the Buxton Advertiser. At the time of the demolition, I never heard so much of a strike. If there was any striking to be done, it was done by the gang or on the job. If the dispute could not be start, settled there and then, it would be resolved at the navigation or the bull's head on a Saturday night. It was a free fight, very rough and tumble. Men would emerge with black eyes, the ganger with his arm in a sling, or worse. A team of coal was found, together with many glacial deposits. The glacial boulders outside Ted Lowe's, the top shop, are further evidence. A prized object was in the shape of a man's pipe, jet black in colour. It was thought to be the remains of some volcanic activity. It was on display in the taproom of the Bull's Head for many years. The navvies claimed it was Noah's pipe, which he had dropped when the ark passed over Bugsworth on its way to the Far East. Here's the milkman, Percy Hancock, outside Bugsworth School. He's with his daughters, Betty and Nellie, and with Betty Kane. It's said that the horse took him home undriven on many occasions after evenings in the Bull's Head. Inside Booksworth School, some time before the war. Jasmine Bates attended between 1956 and 1960, and she wrote, You could always hear the ticking of the clock, the solemn, comforting reliability of the old school clock counting the minutes until playtime, dinner time, home time, and the picture of the laughing cavalier smiled down on us. He seemed to watch me all the time, suave, haughty, slightly smug. He stared down from his place on the wall and witnessed our struggles and occasionally our triumphs. We learned to count with wooden beads and we learned to write with scratchy pens dripping black ink onto snow-white paper. We also learned how to suck sweets in secret, aniseed balls, acid drops, and the lovely sweet cherry lips, leaving red stains on guilty mouths. The classroom smelled of chalk dust and lavender polish and whatever was cooking for dinner. We listened to stories of Samaritans and infidels and raggle taggle gypsies are. We longed for nature walks along the tram lines, foxgloves heavy with rain, yarrow and willow herb, and hawthorn in blossom. We picked Herb Robert for the nature table, and Capkin for the teacher's desk. Heavy old glass jam jars full of colours. At playtimes, we ran and skipped and chased each other like wild things. We fell over and hurt our knees and our pride and sometimes fell into bad ways. We were busy in our games, in and out the dusty bluebells, oranges and lemons, it dip dip, my blue ship, the farmer wants a wife, and we whirled and twirled and danced the dance of children. 
The old pigeons dozed on the skew roof, and grey feathers would drip, drift down to be met treasured in small dirty hands. And we long for a gold star, stuck on by teacher's hallowed spit. And we long for strawberry jelly and praise. We drank our free milk, always warm, always welcome. And we bought nice sugar biscuits for one penny at break time, melting the sugar on our gossipy tongues, chattering like magpies. We would debate the joys and sorrows of what we were having for dinner. Lemon pudding was favourite, but braised liver was considered bad news unanimously. Quite a few pieces of liver were hidden up jersey sleeves to be disposed of artfully. Behind the radiator was the usual hiding place. It smelled terrible when the pipes got hot. We learned songs and hymns and descants. Green gravel, green gravel, the grass is so green. And we spent our threepenny bits at Mrs. Thompson's shop. Banana ice lollies on summer afternoon, the yellow ice trickling between sunburned fingers. Victory V on Wednesday mornings, blackjacks, treacle toffee, and penny chews if funds were low. Mother said, never go near the canal, never talk to strangers, never play in the road. And we went near the canal and talked to strangers and played in the road. The seasons went around so fast and we waited for Christmas in joyous anticipation. It was as if we were uncompassed within a rosy glow, making lanterns, hanging paper chains, watching frost make lace on the big school windows, warming icy fingers on the radiators, sliding in the playground on glassy ice, putting snow down Frank Lomas's vest, collecting holly with jewel-bright leaves, learning the carols to be sung around the tree. The Christmas party was yearned for. We would wear our very best things at this social event. So out came the party frocks and the dicky bows and the clean white hankies. Stephanie Jones once wore a pair of lace gloves. My envy knew no bounds. We had the party feast, heady with fun and tizer. We pulled crackers and played games and waited for Father Christmas to walk in with his old brown sack full of presents. And then our mum would come and walk us home, too weary to talk, up the silk hill and into bed. That whole little hamlet at the foot of Silk Hill also had a school. Here it is pictured shortly before it closed. Miss Drinkwater is surrounded by her pupils. The school opened in 1872 and within two months 103 children had enrolled. In the early years it was often reported by the inspectors as an unruly and difficult school and the plan to have a headmistress and two assistants did not function well as the teachers did not stay long. In July 1878 Mr and Mrs Davis were appointed as master and mistress but we were not very successful and were replaced in February 1883 by Mr and Mrs Wetters. They did not appear to be any more successful as they were dismissed in August 1885. In 1883 the teacher had reported that the children are in a most disorderly and noisy state. They have not the faintest idea what was meant when they were asked to be quiet. Four boys refused to come out from their places when called, and one threatened to throw a book at the monitor's head. In 1880, the afternoon starting time was agreed at 2pm, because the part-timers worked in the mill until 1pm, then had to walk from Whaley Bridge and get their dinners. Throughout its time, that whole school had a very high turnover of staff, many only staying for a few weeks. Annie Jackson, however, stayed for 25 years until 1919. And in 1935, 
Hannah Drinkwater of Big Tree Farm became headmistress. She's described as a commanding figure in tweeds and brogues, sometimes walking to school and sometimes driving her green and cream jowet, especially when she brought with her a large battery powered portable radio. Miss Drinkwater stayed until the school closed in 1947 and the 11 remaining scholars transferred to the council school. Nat Hall also had its own public house, the Yellow Cat, although little is known about the establishment. Its sign can be seen in the background of the school photo. The drink horses of Big Tree Farm on Dolly Lane own considerable lands between Buxworth and New Mills. This picture shows one family member in his cart at Briley Green. He's accompanied by three men, either his employees or family members. To the left of the horse are members of the Carringtons, an ancient and wealthy local family. This next picture is also labelled Mr Drinkwater, clearly a slimmer gentleman than that in the previous photo, and perhaps not related. The location is New Road, not far from the church. The following was written by A.K.F. I don't know his full name. I arrived in Buxworth in 1936, my parents having moved from the Glossop area when I was a six-year-old who thought he knew it all but soon found out different. Educated by Isabel and Nancy Porritt, continued by Penn Butt and concluded by Boss Hallam, you were kept on the straight and narrow by the teachers. In addition, Bobby Bunting put in his pennyworth, standing in the recessed co-op doorway. His gauntlet clipped many an unwary mischief maker. I remember the occasion when classes six and seven were all caned by Boss Hallam for being late back from dinner time after ice skating on the cot. That was a great play area for the kids. The old crane to climb upon and the old kilns to climb into. I was a paper lad for Joe, Joe Watson for a couple of years, four shillings a week and two shillings and sixpence for a double round on Sunday. That included getting the papers off the train at Chinley at 6.45am and taking to the shop on the carrier bike. Friday was the worst day when the reporter came out. It meant two trips to the station. I remember Harry Simpson. What a wheeler dealer character he was. He could lay his hands on anything you wanted and you could always get a bargain. Underneath his house was like an Aladdin's cave. Joe Lomas, Harry's next door neighbour. I've trodden many to a ton of brewer's grains for his cows. That's why his milk was so good. Old Purse Hancock at Knolltop Farm. I deli I've delivered many a gallon of milk in his milk float and walked mile after mile with Purse to swap or buy a cow from a neighbouring farmer. What's Chippy? The best threepence mixed you could get anywhere in the area. Buxworth Football Club had a great first team in the 50s and 60s. Known throughout the district, they won everything going and were feared by all. I've known Nora Campbell turn out for the second team in goal and do better than the regular keeper. Cyril Heap, faithful, faithful secretary to the cricket club. The first 11 had a good side. Hills, Holfords, Les Gagan, Tom Ashton, etc. Braden Holt, who must hold the league record for taking all 10 wickets for I think it was six runs. I did play in that match, but mostly I enjoyed my cricketing with the second eleven under the guidance of San Pine. Tat Rogers, Tom Wilson and Chick Hill, who always got lost getting to the away grounds. I did get the A Division League bowling averages. More good luck than anything else, sir. 
We can see Maud Strippy in this picture. Derek Cope wrote, My parents' first commercial adventure was a chip shop, which stood at the foot of the dungeon, the footpath that runs from the former post office on New Road, diagonally to the Navigation Inn, adjacent to the Bugsworth Basin. It was a dark wooden shack with a steeply sloping roof and a brick chimney at the side facing the black brook. There was a serving counter on the left with the frying fittings behind, a long table where the bench seat faced the counter. At the back, steps led down to the dank and dismal storage area for the fish, potatoes, oil and mineral waters with a small extension at the rear for the empties. This was prior to the ownership of Maud Styles. Heat News, 22nd of January, 1927. A boat wreck at Bogsworth. The Hesperus, or HMS Winnie, as she is also termed, in Bogsworth Harbour, caused rather a sensation last week. But now another episode is added to this thrilling tale of the dangers of the sea. Not the least serious part of the loss of this seagoing vessel was the fact that she blocked up the well-known Peatland port and the extensive ocean traffic between Bugsworth and such far distant points of the earth as Chelmorton docks. To say that the wreck caused immediate consternation scarcely implies the gravity of the situation. Not only had the channel been blocked, but several brave sailors had lost their sleeping quarters. Every day made the situation worse. The port had lost its trade. The dock officials had found work. The company had lost a valuable vessel and the gallant sailors had lost their digs. Some of the greatest brains in the country were focused on the urgent problem, and at last a solution was found. At whatever cost, the boat must be salvaged. And now the quayside became alive with bustle, excitement and anxiety. The Marple Salvage Corps had been secured, regardless of cost, and with this well-known firm, strongly represented, no fears were entertained as to the issue of one of the greatest salvages of our times. Personally, these eminent ship-saving gentlemen calmly emulated a miracle of the first magnitude, details of which appear in Exodus, chapter 14, and made the sea dry, land, and the waters were divided. But in the process of making the dry land there occurred the first casualty in the ranks of those bold marine engineers. One of them, in leaning over to see what the waters were leaving according to order, fell in. Needless to say, he, not being attired in his diving gear, got wet, and the ardour of the enterprise was slightly dampened. But up spake a local man and offered him a pair of offered him a suit of dry clothes. The offer was promptly accepted, and the good Samaritan then set off to his abode to fetch the garments. But the damp one, colder outside and warmer inside with every minute that passed, waited for over an hour, and still the suit had not put in an appearance, possibly because the Samaritan had a wife that looked after his wardrobe. Then came another well-intentioned gentleman, and he quickly supplied the clothes. And it was in borrowed plumes that the poor man was found by the Samaritan on his belated appearance. But this was really the minor incident of this great day. For lo and behold, the water had left the harbour, with but little channel to wet the fishes as they squirmed and wriggled in the mud. These same fishes caused another disaster. One of the Marple Brigade was angling for, for one of these deep sea denizens when he overbalanced and a hollow splash announced that he had become intimately associated with the mud. 
the salvage call were interrupted for a moment or two whilst they salvaged their unfortunate comrade, the man overboard. But soon the work was in progress, and ere the cloth lighthouse began to announce the approach of the night, the leak, or to use the Bogsworth nautical term, lek, it was repaired, and the good ship HMS Winnie was once more fit to sail the seven seas and defy all the Jolly Rogers that ever flew at Pirate's Peak. A life on the ocean wave is all very well, but those who do not know Bugsworth know not what life can be. Oh, these sailor lads and their possible wives. From the H High Peak News on the 30th of April 1927. HMS Winnie, an account of a tugboat on the canal at Bugsworth. With the blue peach at the masthead, dense cheering crowds on the quay, flags outstretched in the breeze, and passengers waving to fearful friends ashore, HMS Winnie left Bugsworth last week for foreign climes. The gallant vessel may have had many an adventure, may a battle with heaving heaving waves on her voyage, but every one of her crew will regard such trifles in comparison with the dangers she has encountered whilst in port. It will be recorded a few, silent, a few short weeks ago, we recorded the thrilling story of this giant vessel's shipwreck within the bustling precincts of the Bogsworth Harbour. And three times round went she, and three times round went she, and three times round our gallant, gallant ship then sank to the bottom of the sea. The words of this old sea song adequately describe the terrible happenings at Boatsworth a while back. But now the Leviathan is watertight once again. Nothing less than an iceberg or a torpedo can disturb her equilibrium. Let's hire to the ducks and see the giant vessel depart. The gangway is cast off, the anchor is dragged by in rattling winch, sailors cheery at the thought of the wife in the next port, gaily sing a life on the ocean waves, while weeping relatives on the quayside wave farewell to those on deck who go to see a better land. But let all fears be dried. The siren gives one long blast and two short hoots. The lapping water at the sides of the monster is cast aside. She moves, she is off. A great roar rises from the multitude. Handkerchiefs, hats and scarves are waved at each cheer, echoes on board. Speak hearts full of pain on leaving dear old boats with shores. So slowly she draws away. The smartly clad sailors are indistinguishable from the passengers. A dense volume of smoke rises on the clear morning air, and soon HMS Winnie begins to sink over the horizon. The crowd disperse with many an eager tale of the sea, the monster vessels that it bears on its bosom, and the men, yes, the real manly men, these self-same liners themselves do carry. So did this vessel depart from the Bugsworth Harbour. Those who are young in this generation, however, will repeat the oft-told tale in years to come of how Bugsworth was the scene of a great shipping disaster and of how the scores of brave sailors nearly went down to Davy Jones' locker. And it's a tale worth worth telling. I don't know who Annie Hill was, but this photograph show has, shows her cycling along New Road. In 1899, the High Peak News reported on the Nick Club. On Tuesday, at Chapel and Frith, magistrates had before them a case which raised great interest in that part of the High Peak, when a William Morris, a labourer, was charged with assaulting Mrs Sarah Rowley, a widow and committing damage to a door of her house, and James Dale, who was charged with damaging a water tub. 
It appears in Bogsworth there exists an institution known as the Nick Club, which caused the chairman of the bench, Colonel Hall, to ask whether it was associated with Old Nick. The members of this secret society are in the habit of going round the locality and visiting houses where females are unprotected, begging money for drink, and when refused, they have no hesitation in smashing their doors and windows and assaulting the inmates. Last week, quite a regiment of these roughs visited a number of houses on the occasion of the wake's festivities, armed with sticks, spades and hammers. When Mrs. Rowley saw them approaching, she locked the door, which they smashed with spades and hammers, and when she appeared round the back and asked them to leave, they refused. Martin seized her by the throat and threw her to the ground. Inflict, he inflicted serious injuries to her and then threatened to strike her with a hammer while the other men looked on. The Reverend James Bowers came up and wrenched the hammer from him. Martin then, thrashed, then threatened to thrash the Reverend gentleman. The defendant pleaded for leniency, but Superintendent Gill said he was an idle fellow and a terror to the neighbourhood. The bench said as a warning to these fellows and others, they should send Martin to prison for 28 days with hard labour for the assault and a further term of 14 days in default of paying a five shilling fine, four shillings damages and costs. They were determined to put down this conduct and to protect helpless people against ruffians as they had had in court that day. Dale was fined 10 shillings on the costs. Failure to pay the fine, he would go to prison for 14 days. The following year, the High Peak reporter said of Bugsworth Wakes, Bugsworth is supposed to hold its wakes at the same time as New Mills, and the holidays are kept up on that occasion. But it seems to become a recognised custom for Johnny Walker to fix up his steam horses and all other paraphernalia on the ground near the Bugsworth Board School after the normal wakes time. And this has come to be regarded as Bugsworth Wakes. Johnny put in an appearance on Tuesday and Bugsworth lads were reciting Bugsworth Wakes is drawing near, lads and lasses will be there. Cracking nuts and eating cakes are what fun at Bugsworth Wakes. And next Saturday, they will be fun. And in 1902, they were still writing about Bugsworth Wakes. Bugsworth to the front, New Mills to the rear. Johnny Walker, with all his paraphernalia, is coming to Bugsworth Wakes. Before New Mills, instead of after. Commencing Friday, August the 22nd, on which occasion he would bring, among other things, performing ponies, living pictures, snake charming, and a host of other things too numerous to mention. So ran the bill which Johnny's inventive genius had co has caused to be circulated in and around Bogsworth, till the place was afire with the news that Bogsworth was to the front. How we wish it were to the front. It was a right royal merry time on Friday, Saturday and Monday evenings in Bogsworth. The village was alive, for it was the Wakes. The second annual Wakes brought into existence by enterprising Johnny Walker alone. Him has Bogsworth to thank for attempting to modernise Bogsworth and bring it up to date. It has long lain in the valley, neglected and unknown. The Midland Railway passing through its very heart has done little or next to nothing to improve it. It has been able to boast a railway tunnel, but even that recommendation has been shorn and left in its place the deepest cutting in England. The wire mattress works employ a few people, the lime kilns a few more, and the canal a few more, but the majority now find work at Chinley or on the railway widening. 
But what is all this to do with the wakes? Well, nothing particular, except to show that Bogsworth has long been hidden from sight, been neglected. But at last the proprietor's keen eye has been focused on it, and Johnny Walker has struck oil by conferring on Bogsworth the honour of a wakes. And Bogsworth people has not, have not failed to appreciate it. They have loyally supported the enterprise by turning up on Saturday and Monday in great numbers and letting a little of their superfluous cash change hands. The publicans too reaped a nice little hoard and everybody seemed quite happy with the opportunity of letting the coin of the realm make a circuitous route round from their pockets to the pockets of Johnny and his men and a few owners of cash penny contrivances. In July, in July 1919, the High Peak reporter wrote about the toll bar. Next Monday, Chapel Council are to consider the motion to purchase Bogsworth New Road, which has upon it one of the few toll bars remaining in the country. The road was brought by Major Broadhurst, JP, on behalf of the Highways Committee, and the resolution on Monday is only a confirmatory one. The toll bar will then disappear. It was in 1855 that the road was made. Bugsworth was then busy with its canal lime kilns, stone quarries, but no cart road in the direction of New Mills, Stockport and Manchester. A few local capitalists formed a limited company to construct a road about a mile in length to open out to the new Stockport to Buxton Road. Some thousands of pounds were expended, but before the road could be completed, the London and North Western Railway Company made their line on an embankment. They had the power to do this under the Act of Parliament, but it blocked the new road and accounts for what is frequently called a bottleneck at the Whaley Bridge end. They were obliged, however, to complete their work, and this they did by continuing alongside the railway embankment. The toll bar house was built and the toll was mortgaged by the gentleman who financed them. It was thought this mortgage that the road came into the possession of the late Reverend Gawthorne, whose death brought the estate on the market. What a serious drawback the toll bar has been to Bugsworth. Maybe from a list of tolls, a load of coal, five pence. One cart horse, four pence. A horse and carriage, six pence. Two horses and carriage, nine pence. A load of stone, six pence. Horse and wagonette, nine pence. Cycles a penny. Horse a penny. A cow a halfpenny. Sheep, calves and pigs, a farthing a head. Most of people will heartily rejoice when the toll bar is demolished. Although the tolls were abolished early in July, they were reimposed later in the month. The High Peak reporter wrote almost monthly of the delays in finally abolishing the tolls, but it wasn't until 1920 that the people of Bugsworth were able to celebrate, as seen in this photograph. Bugsworth Cricket Club, founded in 1848, has a long and distinguished history, but there was one occasion when they failed to excel. It was in May 1923 when they travelled to Whaley Bridge for an away match. Their opening bowler, John Goddard, had fallen out with the club and joined their rivals and now faced his former colleagues. Goddard only bowled five overs but took five wickets for no runs. His fellow bowler, Exley, also bowled five overs, but having taken the remaining four wickets, he did concede one run, scored by Wetters, the last man in. Bogsworth were all out for one. Needless to say, Whaleybridge had little trouble in passing that total to win the match. It was a different story in 1959 when Bogsworth played Newton Mill. Bowler Brayton Holt 
took all 10 Newton Mill wickets for just four runs. The bowler at the other end conceded 19. A well-known and long-serving bowler was Les Gagan. It seems that he was noted for keeping pigs. And for many years, these cartoons by Annie Nonny Mouse graced the walls of the Bugsworth Clubhouse. This is the story of the Bugsworth Sow. In a little hamlet not far away, upon the hill where Bugsworth play, there's peace and quiet, not a sound, for at that cricket they are renowned. Gagan said bowler, he's the star man, you hit him for six if you can. In his garden at home he digs and digs, and all his spare time he gives to his pigs. In the Hewitt Cot, in the Hewitt Cop they played High Lane, but Gagan stopped at home, his pig was in pain. It wasn't ill health, no sow was fitter, it just happened so it was expecting a litter. In Bugsworth at last the tension was eased, and with his thirteen peglets Gagan's well pleased. They got the job over. I don't know how, for we all felt sorry for Gagan's sow. In the White House they kick up a row, but Gagan's so quiet he thinks of his sow. Under Bill Smith he slaves all the day, and his chicken and pigs make up his pay. This little ditty I must conclude. Conclude, I hope Gagan doesn't think I have been rude. If that be the case, I'll take a bow and let him go home to his piglets and sow. This is one of the last pictures of Keith, taken not long before he died in 2020. I've only shown, shown a small selection of material from this archive. We were hoping that before long the collection might be available to view on a website. was born in Bogsmith on the 16th of October 1935 and died in Chinley on the 15th of June 2020. He was married to Margaret, nay Fryat, and they had four children. Keith had only one job. He was a cartographic surveyor for the Ordnance Survey for 40 years until he took early retirement. In his younger days, he played football for New Mills Grammar School then both football and cricket for Bugsworth clubs, and later Chapel Athletic Football Club. In the 60s, he was heavily involved in local protests over the dumping of highly toxic asbestos waste in Crest Quarry, Bugsworth. Following on from that, he became a parish, rural district, and later a borough councillor. He also, also served as a Justice of the Peace for a number of years. He was that very enthusiastic about local history, helping to transcribe local birth, death and marriage registers onto a searchable database. He enjoyed writing for local publications, principally about the area's history, as well as giving talks to diverse local groups. Over the course of many years, he and Margaret raised thousands of pounds of funds for the National Trust. He was a keen photographer, and had many of his pictures featured in the Buxton Advertiser and on Granada News, which pleased him immensely. He was also perversely chopped to hold the record at Withenshaw Hospital for the number of gallstones removed in one go, 37. He died of cancer. At his own request, there was not a funeral. <laughs>